Hello. I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation. Um, so uh, I would like to uh, begin by saying it's sort of unfair that Yuri had 20 minutes for just NIFP, and I have to do all the genetics of thyroid cancer in 20 minutes. But um, anyway, I can do it. So there's my disclosure. So in 2019, we have a wealth of knowledge. Um, starting in the 1980s, studies on RAS and RET fusions in the 90s, and then BRAF V600E, uh, innumerable molecular studies. And then, um, so I was the co-chair of the TCJ. That started around 2010. We published that in 2014. Uh, there's been um, several studies on radiation-induced uh, cancer from the Chernobyl accident. And then TCJ did a thing called Pan Cancer Atlas, where they aggregated the data from 11,000 tumors, 33 cancer types, and published a whole series of papers. So thyroid was included in that. Uh, MSK Impact, uh, the studies that we've seen a little bit of Tim Fagan's group, <coughs> excuse me, I'm fighting this dry cough, of poorly differentiated and anaplastic carcinoma. And then uh, we'll hear from Dr. Haugen, who's, whose group in Colorado did a study in which they aggregated publicly available data, uh, mostly on aggressive and anaplastic thyroid cancer. So there was just a wealth of data. So this is a, a big talk in a short time. So I, when thinking about this, I tried to extract what I thought were 18 essential insights, starting sort of at papillary and working our way towards anaplastic. So we'll see. So let's begin. So this is one of those Pan Cancer Atlas projects. This was on copy number and ploidy. And you can see at the very top there where the, where the arrow is, that thyca, uh, that's what the TCJ called th papillary thyroid cancer, uh, for thyroid cancer, um, has the lowest level of aneuploidy. They developed this aneuploidy score. Uh, and so it's basically telling us that, the, that papillary thyroid cancer has a very stable cancer genome, very picture, big picture, <coughs> sort of like karyotype. Um, and it sort of explains why PTC does so well, right? It's, it has a very stable cancer genome without many uh, copy number changes. Same thing for mutational burden. This is a, a relative snapshot of just mutations across the genome. And you can see Thyca again, is on the very left. This is a logarithmic scale. And the cancers that have high mutational burdens are on, on your right. And they are melanoma and lung cancers, the cancers that are associated with, with high carcinogenic uh, burdens. Um, so again, this, together with the copy number, is telling us we have a stable cancer genome with a low number of mutations. And again, together, these sort of explain the indolent nature of PTC. However, in the TCJ study, I was able to uh, sniff out uh, some tumors that had higher mutational densities or burdens. There's a few tumors there, and you can see their histologies. They're all sort of more complex cancers, either tall cells or, or others. And more formally, the tall cell variants as a group have a higher mutational burden. So you can, even within PTC, you can start to develop a story in which the number of mutations is associated with more aggressive disease. Um, this has been known for a long time that, that um, in, insight number three, that the MAP kinase pathway and the PI3 kinase pathway dominate papillary thyroid cancer, but all these genomic studies just reinforce that. So we have uh, RET fusions and other tyrosine kinase fusions, RAS point mutations, and BRAF point mutations, uh, all in these pathways. So we won't spend a lot of time on this uh, particular pathway, but again, this is what we found in, in the TCGA and other studies. So this is a, a, a kind of a crucial point. Uh, Papillary thyroid cancer, there were a lot of studies that talked about coexistence of mutations, and we really didn't see it here. Is there a pointer on this? Um, got it. So you can see here, um, there's BRAF mutations, mostly V600E. There's some indels and a K601 mutation. These are RAS and EIF1AX. They're mutually exclusive with each other. And then uh, when those end, you can see the fusions are represented here. The fusions are mutually exclusive with each other and mutually exclusive with the point mutations. So this basically telling us at the level of papillary carcinoma, there's no really biological advantage of having more than one driver mutation. There was a single tumor out of 402 that had three mutations. It had a RAS mutation, BRAF V600E, and EIF1AX. One out of 402. So it really tells you very clearly that these are mutually exclusive, and they don't, they, they're sort of all doing the same thing, but subtly different, okay? The other point here is that 
Um, when these end, there are, there's an enrichment of copy number changes, and it suggests that copy number changes can also function uh, as dry ring mutations. But a very beautiful picture here of sort of elegant simplicity at PTC. So um, number five, these driver mutations, the follow-up of that is that they do have distinct biological and histologic properties. So if you distill down all the information from the TCGA, uh, you can see that we sort of come up with three, three big forms of PTC. The classical or tall cell type that are predominated by B, BRAF V600E that have very distinct signaling properties with strong ERK transcriptional activation. So they have high output and are less differentiated. We have the RAS-like tumors that are enriched for the follicular variant that have uh, uh, signaling along the pathway that gives sort of weak ERK uh, activation. So these tumors are more differentiated but have lower MAP kinase output. And then sort of the RET fusions sort of fall in the middle there. They signal the same way but they sort of have a mixture. So this is a really beautiful illustration of what the TCGA found uh, at, at the multi-dimensional multi, uh, level. So um, to take it one step further, there is this strong correlation between histotype, genotype, and gene expression profiles. And this is a study from my lab going back to 2005 in which we looked at expression of thousands of genes and did a principal component analysis and then overlaid the genotype, and you could see the BRAF mutated tumors cluster and are enriched for tall cell tumors, the RAS mutated tumors cluster and are enriched for follicular, and the classical tumors are enriched for red PTC and other fusions. And so this is why, because of this correlation between histotype gene expression and genotype, is why all the various molecular tests on the market seem to work pretty well, because you can look at gene expression, look at genotype, they're all telling us sort of the same thing. Excuse me. So Yuri showed this already. This is another figure from the TCGA. I think this insight, number seven, is one of the, will be one of the most enduring things that came out of the TCGA study. This framework of RAS-like versus BRAF V600E-like. And I'm glad, Yuri, you, you stressed BRAF V600E-like because that was one of the things we stressed in the paper because as we'll see, I think number eight is not all BRAF mutations are the same. Uh, and so this broad, broad um, distinction here shows this RAS-like group, the BRAF V600E-like group, but you can sort of see the fusion group in the middle here. The BRAF fusions and some of the other fusions are sort of here, and there's this third group out here that has nothing but BRAF V600E that are those uh, tall cell tumors and others that are really have strong MAP kinase output. So this framework is really useful, and you could see in Yuri's uh, study where he lists the, the mutations in this framework of what the mutation's uh, biological properties were. So this, um, I think, is, again, one of the more enduring uh, uh, frameworks that came from the TCGA study. Uh, number eight, as I said, BRAF can be activated by various mechanisms with different biologies and pathologies. So um, most are V600E, but we had one mutation that was K601E, and that tumor is right here. It's extremely RAS-like, and uh, those of you may not know, but these are almost always the follicular variant of, of PTC. So it's, it's telling us that this BRAF mutation signals like, more like a, um, a RAS-like tumor or a RAS mutation. These other BRAF, BRAF others, these are indels, um, short insertions or deletions, and they're more like RAS-like. You can see the BRAF fusions are sort of weekly BRAF V600E-like. So this, fr this provides a framework, again, for understanding all the various uh, mutations that you find. So just to drive home the point, point mutations, gene fusions, and indels. So BRAF is a rather promiscuous molecule and can become an oncogene uh, via uh, many mechanisms. And again, this desire to be precise, because I, a lot of people just say BRAF-like, and that, but that's not precise enough for, for what, so again, we tried to stress that in the TCJ. Excuse me. So we also looked uh, thoroughly at differentiation. We developed the thyroid differentiation score. But just to make the point that, if you think about it, the classification of thyroid cancer is based on differentiation. And, and so you can see the importance of differentiation even at the PTC level. 
So uh, here are some genes that are involved in thyroid function, TG, the symporters in here, and here's the genotypes. So the first thing to notice, and here's some normal thyroid, first thing to notice that the BRAF V600E cases are less differentiated, greatly less differentiated than many of the other mutated tumors or normal thyroid. We knew that. What was interesting about this is that there's a, still a group here that, um, that exists within that cohort that's a little better differentiated. Excuse me. So it suggests that there's more biological diversity within that mutated group. Again, uh, the theme is more heterogeneity than we might have guessed going in. So, so differentiation is a, a key part, and it also uh, speaks to all these studies where therapeutics are trying to redifferentiate the thyroid cancer for therapeutics. So uh, let's move on to progression. So this is a very simple figure from one of Yuri's book chapters that basically talks about the number of driving mutations. And the point is, as you go from differentiated or papillary carcinoma to poorly differentiated or anaplastic, the number of driving mutations increase. And this is sort of the general model of cancer progression. More mutations means more aggressive tumors. We're seeing that across all tumor types, and it's certainly true uh, for thyroid cancer. And uh, in this study, which is the MSK impact study um, at, out of Memorial, you can basically see that just by this gestalt of poorly differentiated carcinoma and anaplastic with all the additional mutations piling up. And we'll show this a couple of times. But basically, uh, the BRAF and the RAS, same thing, but the addition of many other mutations in other pathways. The key point, going back to essential point number seven, is that the RAS-like and BRAF V600E-like distinction is preserved in poorly differentiated carcinoma, but it tends to be lost in anaplastic, at least in the data that, that they had in their study. So I, I thought that was interesting. And these mutations, essential point number 11, uh, when you have histologic pro progression, the additional mutations are concentrated in a few pathways and families. So you have PI3 kinase uh, mutations, SWI SNF complex mutations, histone modifiers, mismatch repair mutations, and you can see the frequency, frequencies are summarized here uh, with poorly differentiated anaplastic, and then the increase in these pathways as you go along the way. So this is, makes a beautiful model of stepwise progression due to the accumulation of mutations as you go from differentiated to poorly to anaplastic thyroid cancer. Um, number 12 and 13 I put together. Uh, basically saying that mutations of P53 and TERP promoter play a role in the thyroid cancer progression, uh, aggression and progression. And so you can see them here in that same figure. Here's TERT coming in at 40% in poorly differentiated carcinomas uh, and 73% in anaplastic. And here's P53, much lower at 8%. Um, but then very much uh, 73 again percent. So again, this stepwise accumulation of additional mutations in key, key genes leading to, and, and as you know, the P53 is sort of the guardian of the genome, and once you have those mutations, then, then the opportunity for the genome to become unstable uh, arises, and that's when you start to lead to, you lose that quiet genome in poorly different, in, in papillary carcinoma when you evolve on further. And here's a case just from uh, two weeks ago at Michigan that was a hybrid case of a sort of a complex papillary carcinoma and a, a tumor with necrosis and mitotic activity. Uh, ended up calling this a poorly differentiated carcinoma because it still had high levels of expression of TTF1 at immunohistochemistry. But you can see this mutation pattern of P53. So this is one of those maybe 8% of poorly differentiated carcinomas that have P53 mutations. But again, it's speaking to the fact that this is a much more aggressive, uh, biologically aggressive tumor. And then I think uh, we saw some of this data earlier uh, at the, in the pathology session, but was interesting, this is data from uh, that MSK impact Landa study in which they looked back on the TCGA and showed that the allele frequency of TERP promoter mutations was subclonal, not present in all the tumor cells. But yet by the time you got to poorly differentiated tumors and anaplastic, we reached a level of clonality uh, measured at 0.5. And so uh, it, it sort of starts to build this model in which 
uh, the TERP promoter mutations accumulate in tumor cells and then enrich uh, to the point of clonality as the tumor evolves down that pathway. Uh, I'm not aware of any in situ method to look at TERP promoter mutations, but, uh, but we can certainly do this with, with P53, but it would, it would be nice to do that, to look at whether those are nodules that occur or they're scattered throughout the tumor. Maybe we'll get to single cell sequencing, we'll answer that. So this is sort of kind of interesting, very interesting data. And then if you look at the MSK impact study, they published a study on 10,000 patients that were profiled at MSK. Um, and the MSK impact study is people that need treatment. So these are patients with, usually with metastatic disease or aggressive disease. Maybe these are all metastatic disease. And you could see in that cohort, so it's a very biased cohort, but here's thyroid cancer. Nearly 60% of their patients have TERP promoter mutation. So it's, it's uh, sort of telling us that, again, that these are enriched for those most aggressive tumors that would get profiled at Sloan Kettering by the MSK impact assay. And even in their cohort, even, in, even papillary TERP promoter mutations uh, have a, a worse outcome. There's lots of data. I don't have time to show all the data on TERP, but there's many studies by Ming Zhao, Jin at, uh, at Johns Hopkins, and others that talked about TERP promoter mutation. So I think this is almost to the point of being established uh, science. Uh, the question is now, how do we pathologists deliver this information to our clinicians? In Michigan, we're, we haven't settled that. I know at Pittsburgh, you guys are routinely looking for TERP promoter mutations. So more will come. And then uh, on to Herthel cell carcinoma. There were two papers uh, published back to back in Cancer Cell um, last year. Uh, this is the one from the MGH group. And they basically show that Herthel cell carcinoma has uh, very distinct genomic profiles with extreme copy number alterations, mitochondrial mutations, and increased mutations overall. Uh, this is a, a copy numbers diagram that blue shows loss of DNA, and then the dark red is uh, genome doubling. So this, I also study adrenal cancer. This remarkably is very similar to what we see in adrenal cancer, where we have loss of DNA and then genome doubling. And, and, and complex copy number changes. So Herthel cell carcinoma and adrenal cortical carcinoma may actually be uh, sort of molecularly related. The other study uh, was from um, uh, MSK, and here it's complicated plot, but basically there's a higher mutational burden, but here you can see the copy number type, and they, they have extreme copy number changes. So the studies are in high agreement with each other that these are fundamental processes. And I think the point of this is that this debate of whether Herthel cell was a subtype of follicular carcinoma, I think it's pretty settled now that it really should be its own type of thyroid cancer. Uh, Radiation-induced uh, cancers, um, insight number 15, uh, they're mutually exclusive, and radiation-induced cancers are enriched for gene fusions and have a much lower uh, frequency of point mutations like BRAF V600E compared to sporadic. So that's, that's certainly an interesting thing. And I know there's still a big study going on with Stephen Chinook on these tumors um, ongoing. So we'll have more data on these tumors. Uh, number 16, this is an Ohio State-Michigan collaboration. Yes, it happens sometimes, um, in which we shared our metastatic samples and they were evaluated at Ohio State. And basically, we did find some novel mutations. I won't go through the details. I think this was a small study, and we need to do more of this to really get at uh, some of the mutational profiles of metastases. Um, number 17, I think, is the point is that we really need big data. This is the study that I mentioned out of the Colorado group, where they aggregated uh, all the existing publicly available data from Foundation One testing and MSK and, and probably others, and, uh, and using that, all that data, they were able to extract insights into the various clusters present in anaplastic thyroid cancer, which is not a tr trivial feat. So this is all out there now and needs to be uh, further worked on and, and validated. But by having big data like TCGA and like this study, we can extract insights that just aren't possible. So we need big data. And then finally, um, I think the last insight is that these mutational frameworks, you saw it in Yuri's talk, the mutational frameworks are really fundamentally changing how we think about thyroid cancer. So here's the framework from that Colorado paper where we can talk about different subtypes of thyroid cancer and, and really start to match up 
the therapeutics uh, to these frameworks. And then I'll close, I'm out of time, uh, I'll close with this beautiful figure which was in this New England Journal review by Jim Fagan and Sam Wells that sort of shows papillary carcinoma with the common drivers and the frequencies uh, leading to poorly differentiated carcinoma with additional mutations, P53, and then anaplastic with these additional mutations. So it's a really elegant framework. It's, even with the Colorado paper, it's more complicated than that now, but it's still a nice framework to keep in mind. And with that, I will close and thank you for your attention.